Now, from high atop his desk, get ready to peel it all back and get to the root of the subject. No pun intended. With Paul K on Wine Talks, where he takes no prisoners and calls it the way he sees it. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today, live in Southern California, Monrovia, on a beautiful day. We have Brian Talley here from Talley Vineyards. We'll get to the introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available at Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, you name it, wherever you are hanging out for podcasts, we are there. And always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now sporting the Napa and Bordeaux series. But enough of that, because we have a very special guest and having a lot of fun already. Didn't want to waste the laughter. And that is Mr. Brian Talley from Talley Vineyards. Welcome to the show. Well, Paul, thank you for having me. I look forward to a fun conversation. It's going to be funny and fun. And, I, I, and I'm sorry that you just found out yesterday, and but you seem pretty loose, so it's pretty cool. I like, <laughs> so. to, I like to talk. I like to tell my story. You know, I was doing some, I was doing a little research, and we're going to talk about your book. We're going to talk about the AVA. We're going to talk about SIP certification. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. And who knows which direction our conversation will go. But I was doing a little research, and this part's a little unusual in California. I can, in Europe, yeah, three generations of farmers, and particularly grape growers, uh, not unusual. But California, three generations has got to be a record almost. Or close. Well, you Not know, right. there there are there are some older families um, in Northern California, and um, gosh, I'm um, trying to think of who comes to mind. But you know, one of the challenges we face in in California is just the financial uh, reality of, mm-hmm. of the wine business, and um, you know, a lot of folks make a decision that um, the best thing to do is is to sell their business. Um, you know, many many successful wineries. And that's just not part of my equation. Well, that's which we appreciate, and that's a no. That's a really important thing. And it, I've been talking to chefs over the over this last months, and I was telling you we're going to talk about the cookbook in a little bit. But I've been talking to a lot of chefs, uh, authors of cookbooks. I want tomorrow, not cookbooks, but uh, food books. One tomorrow, and there's something unique about the European model with restaurants, where the there is a lineage of owners, and there is this longevity of of food in a family, and it continues to grow. And we don't see that so much. Even, Forget about, you know, including the farming, but as well as in the restaurant trade. Do you think it's a an American thing to move on and just you know, move on and put it through the trust or whatever we do with the money? Or it, it this is going to be happening because America is just behind the curve because it's just not so old? Um, I, I think that it's partly a cultural uh, issue. I mean, I'm I'm friends with a, um, a German wine maker, winemaker named Johannes Selbach, mm-hmm. and he has been making stunning Riesling in uh, uh, you know from from Germany. I can't remember if he's from the Mosul or um, <clears throat> the. I think he's actually from the Rhine. Uh, but in in any event, I mean, many generations, and he takes pride in that. That's really central to his identity to carry on this family business, this family legacy, and he's raising his children to do the same. And I find that inspiring. And it is. That's, that's my plan. And in addition to our winery, we operate a vegetable farm and I'm partners with my cousins in that business. And we're all committed to carrying on our business to give our fourth generation the same opportunity that we had. That's great. Because we love what we do. That is inspiring. I, I just noticed on the cover of your book, you know, you've got the whole family here and then and yep. you just said the cousins are involved. Well, my cousins are the are the guys that are in that in the picture. Uh, in the picture yep. And you have sisters. Uh, I actually, uh, I do not have any oh, siblings. Sister. I, okay. I had one sister oh, who okay. passed okay. away in 93. Because I was going to say, I have to, uh, I'm not sure I could work with my cousins. And <laughs> well, we we and my sister, we, and my we benefit. We we figured out a few years ago that our family, uh, we tend to get along. We like to get along. We're we're all That's on the. I'm, I'm sort of the highest energy of the bunch, you know. Wow. So. Well, okay. So that, let's go back to those days. You know how this generation started. Were your were your parents? Were your great? I guess your grandparents, the third generation. Yeah. Were they born here? So my, my grandfather was born in southern Monterey County in a little tiny town called Bradley, and his family was basically working and supporting the oil fields in San Ardo mm-hmm. at that time. Very shortly, they moved to Santa Barbara County. 
County. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Santa Maria um, was very much an oil town. It was uh, pretty much controlled by Standard Oil. And so um, that's what the family was doing. Um, he graduated from college, um, UC Berkeley, uh, during the Depression. Um, I heard his first job was actually guarding an oil well, which, you <laughs> well. know, when in, 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 during the Depression, any job was a good job. It's good where you can get it. <laughs> yeah, and he basically parlayed that into um, getting involved in farming in the, in the Santa Maria Valley, which is, has a huge vegetable industry. Uh, then um, had the opportunity to move north to the Arroyo Grande Valley. Uh, be, became partners with the guy he was working with and then eventually bought his partner out and established Tally Farms in 1948. So the Royal Grande runs parallel to the coast, right? No, it actually runs perpendicular. It's, runs an, perpendicular. It, okay. it's an east-west valley that opens to, to the Pacific. And how far south is that from Monterey proper? So um, a lot of people confuse Arroyo Grande, which means big ditch or big creek with Arroyo Seco, uh -huh. which is, uh, that, that is, uh, that's another that valley to the north. And that, that's the, the dry creek or the dry valley. We yes. are the Arroyo Grande, the big creek or the uh, big ditch. Right. Actually. So he, he decides, I mean, I'm at, obviously things were much more rural in those days. And uh, that was the, you know, the, the crop of the, the vegetable farming was something that was happening in that area. Um, he thought this was a good idea. He got financing. How did he get this started that we've been able to have it for three generations? Well, and so really the big breakthrough, first of all, as I understand it, World War II was good for farmers, um, partly because they, they almost got an automatic uh, deferment. Uh, he also had uh, some, some physical issues with his back, so he did not participate uh, in the war. Mm. But it, it really uh, apparently was a good time for farmers. Um, the big turning point for us though, was when my father, who also went to UC Berkeley, uh, came back to the business and had the insight and the vision to encourage my, my grandfather to start buying land. We didn't own anything until, um, 1966, which was also the year that I was born. And we bought our first parcel, um, which is actually the site of, of Rosemary's Vineyard in 1966, 1969. Three years later, we bought another parcel, which is where the headquarters of our farming operation is. And then um, five years after that, 1974, we bought um, a ranch that became the site of the Rincon Vineyard. Really? Right, wow. And all of these parcels had uh, hillside property uh, where we couldn't grow vegetables. Uh, at that time, um, in the early 1970s, uh, drip irrigation was really unheard of in, uh, in California. And so now we, we irrigate virtually everything that we grow with either drip or micro sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, the only thing that we could potentially grow on these hillsides were either avocados, which we do grow, uh, and wine grapes. And uh, actually, the site of Rosemary's Vineyard, my, my father did plant avocados initially, but the very lower part of the vineyard was really subject to, to frost. And uh, avocados just don't- They don't like that they at don't all. tolerate frost, right. You know, it's kind of interesting. We, there's, a, we're, there's peeling back some commonalities here. One, my mom's name is Rosemary as well. And my father grew avocados. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Out in, in this area? In Escondido, or? yeah. Okay, wow. He just, he's 92 now, so he stopped doing it. But for a long time, he had avocado. He had 500 trees, and he was, you know, he loved it because he always, he came from Cairo, Egypt, but uh, always felt like he was a farmer. And I think they had a farm, one of the family members had a farm in Egypt. So um, he just always was called back to it after he got done with his pharmacy work. But um, so why, but why? You're growing vegetables, and now we we, we see hillside, and it's the '70s. It's still pretty early in the wine trade for California. There weren't that many families. I think Napa probably had 17 or 22 wineries or something like that. And you decided to plant wine grapes. Were you thinking you're going to make wine then, or the family thinking they're going to make wine? They're just going to plant the grapes and sell. Well, them? that that was interesting, and that was 
<clears throat> a topic of discussion between my father and, and my grandfather. And uh, my my grandfather did not want to get into the wine business. He he liked b- the vegetable business, which, uh, you know, we, we typically spend anywhere from uh, 60 to 150 days growing the crop. Uh, we sell them to people and we get paid in 30 days. And he knew that the cash flow in the wine business wasn't going to be like that. Uh, he was very risk averse. And so, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to get in the wine business. My, my father's pitch was, we'll grow grapes and sell them to others. Well, right as, so he started planting wine grapes, Rincon Vineyard, 1982. Um, basically, we came online uh, that basically timed with a bit of a glut in, in yeah, the industry. <laughs> uh, plus, you know, we were growing in a place called the Arroyo Grande Valley that yeah. nobody had ever heard of. We were kind of the pioneers there. Right. So, you know, my dad had the insight, okay, we need to make some wine to show people, you know, what this is capable of. So, um, hired a guy named Steve Rasmussen, um, mm-hmm. as, sure. as, uh, uh, our consultant. Uh, he's actually, um, up in Paso Robles, um, yeah. uh, to this day. And uh, he came down in 1986 was was our first vintage. And then the decision was made at that point to establish Tally Vineyards as a separate business that was owned, um, essentially founded and owned by my parents. And so it was an offshoot of Tally Farms. Um, my, my father had a younger brother who was the father of my cousins who, uh, passed away very early in his Mm -hmm. life. He was 30, uh, Uh died of cancer. And so, um, in any event, that's why we have these two separate businesses because my grandparents just didn't want to be in the wine business. But there's kind of a funny little piece of this though. By the time my grandfather, um, passed away. So we started the winery in 86 and he passed away in 1999. The winery had become very successful and he was pretty much taking credit for, <laughs> <laughs> for starting the winery. So he, he, that's came, funny. he came full circle. Yeah. <laughs> well, after a bottle or two of some of the, the famed Tally Vineyards wine, you know, you, your perspective changes, of course. Well, he really loved the fact that we planted a vineyard in the Edna Valley and named it after him. Oh, well, then that's, you know, yeah. You, you guys are you're smarter. You're smart merchandisers. I can see that. Well, you know, family politics is a good one. Exactly. So that, when you but you're growing vegetables and grapes are two different things. You can you can sell the crop of of you know green beans immediately. You, know, you have to, or else they're going to be there. You're not going to see them again. But you can't necessarily, you know, a Chardonnay or a Pinot Noir can take a couple of years before it gets to the market. So you got to sit on a lot of cash. I can see your grandfather's resistance. But did any of the principles carry over from farming vegetables to grapes or did just it was just like well we'll give it a shot you brought in a, did you hire a vineyard consultant at the time to plant it or we just sort of well that that was uh that was an interest that's a wonderful question first of all the the principle that carried over was my father's commitment to quality mm-hmm. and his attitude in the vegetable business even though fundamentally the wholesale produce business which is what we do is a commodities business mm-hmm. i mean the prices go up and down but my father's insight was the best quality always sells for the highest price. Mm-hmm. And even if the market is depressed, at least it sells. Right. So let's focus on on quality. That's a good point. And so he um, actually, we had hired a gentleman named John Seitzer, whose um, uncle had a, a, a very successful vineyard management business in the Napa Valley. So John came down, um, it's actually going to Cal Poly uh, in San Luis Obispo at the time that we hired him. And he he um, planted the original vineyards for us. Um, my dad, um, along with John, they made wine together for a couple of vintages in 1984 and 85. And my dad realized right away that we just weren't capturing the potential, mm-hmm. you know, the learning curve was, was a little mm-hmm. too steep. So hired Steve Rasmussen, a UC Davis trained winemaker who at the time was working for Corbett Canyon winery. Just Corbett Canyon. Corbett wow. Canyon, Canyon, <laughs> Canyon. Forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and Corbett Canyon. And that's so funny. At that time, they were doing something very interesting, which was buying wine grapes from uh, Santa Barbara County up through Edna Valley, where we were mm-hmm. um, Royal Grande Valley and then up through Paso Robles. And they had launched um, a really cool, you know, kind of a, a value oriented that's brand. Right. That's right. 
called Corbett Canyon. Corbett Canyon. And the and commercials. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, and then eventually what happened was that was that was a distiller uh, called Glenmore that started Corbett Canyon. They then sold it to the wine group, which um, unfortunately Corbett Canyon went another direction after that. It was sort of a- Yeah, you see a lot of that in our industry. And I, we probably should peel some of that back. I, it, you mentioned this quality factor, which is so important. And just being a quality, I signed up for the vegetables to your home. Uh, I wanted to just have some fun with it. I like to cook at home. My wife and I cook a lot, so I thought I'd give it a, a shot. So we'll be making something out of, I don't even know what's in this this month's box. I only saw the May 17th box with some asparagus and some strawberries and some blueberries. Right. But <laughs> I'm looking forward to doing that. But yes, quality is the m- most important thing. Uh, uh, do you think that, and I'm going to push forward a little bit to sort of the marketing side of things, and we'll, we'll bounce back and forth, but... In today's environment, particularly in the direct consumer world, which has changed everything, uh, and COVID has you know accelerated that change, and we're not even sure people that do this every day trying to figure out what it is is next down the pike when it comes to the consumer's needs. But clearly, with the advent of every everybody trying to make wine and celebrity based wines, and Snoop Dogg's got a wine, and this, and just on and on, and the barrage of labels and brands that consumers are, are being hit with. Do you think the quality f- equation st- stands a chance? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Grandpa, it says grandpa. I, I, well, you know, I, at, the, at the end of the day, there is always going to be a place for world-class wine. And, you know, that's, that's what I've been committed to making since I got into this business. And uh, there's always going to be some segment of the population that wants – really special, inspiring wines. And, well, you're right. And that's and, the best so, word, inspiring. Well, and and so that's that's what I am absolutely committed to. And there are times where it gets a little frustrating and, and <laughs> you know, and quite frankly, there is more great wine being produced in the world right now than ever before in history. And so the competition is certainly stiffer than than when we started. Well, the technology is changing and the, the, they're cross-planting varietals. They're trying different varietals in parts of the world. And that's a whole other subject. You know, I've got friends of mine who are Armenian. They want to bring Adani, which is a indigenous Armenian grape, to the Napa Valley. And I'm like, you can't just do that. You know, just... Well, it, they actually could. They, that's they the cool could do thing. It, they, right? The, they the cool thing it. about California compared to the, France that's is true. You, you can do that. You're you right. That, that is a huge difference. The new world allows you to do it. It's not inexpensive and cheap and not no. you know necessarily going to work, but you can do it if you want to do it, right? Um, but this experience you talked about, inspiring, is a very important word for the wine world. Is it as inspiring to have a fresh vegetable that reflects, you know, where it's grown and what it is? It can be. I, and, you know, I mean, and the things that we grow that, Inspire, inspire me, especially on the vegetable side. Uh, we grow just some wonderful uh, heirloom tomatoes. Oh, okay, yeah. so cool. And, look forward and, to those. Yeah, so uh, we box. won't we won't know that that you you don't get those till the late summer. It's a <laughs> very right, cool region. So so yeah, we we grow these beautiful Cherokee purple um, tomatoes that I just love. We grow some very very good corn. Uh, you can look for that after um, the Fourth of July. We grow uh, wonderful avocados, and if I would have known about this i would have brought you some well, just to just to show you i think the generally the public doesn't get a chance to taste a properly ripened tree avocado from the farm they are a different breed than the right. stuff we buy at the markets and i've my dad was so particular about about making sure he got the best stuff to the market that he had two trees on the property that were we were allowed to pick the rest <laughs> you couldn't touch. Right. Those are all for the pickers to come and get the good stuff. And these were very good, obviously. And sometimes you'd say, well, you got to pick it up off the ground. Otherwise, you know, we're selling the rest. Right. <laughs> like, like, well, he's a merchant, right? So, so, but there's something, uh, and the reason I brought that up, there's something ethereal about a glass of wine that your wines are very, very well made, the, the complexity, and they do have that, they carry with it that, that inspiring value, like, wow, this is something different than what I'm used to tasting. And I think you and I are on the same page that we we want the consumers to have that same experience. 
Well, exactly. And and one of the things that I try to do with our wines is is really celebrate the natural ingredient. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, there each of the wines uh, is is uh, well. In the case of the whites, they're they're fermented and aged in French oak barrels. The the Pinot Noir is aged for typically about fifteen months in in French oak. Um, but we're uh, careful with how much uh, oak we're using, um, partly because it's expensive, but even more so, um, I want to make wines that taste like my grapes mm-hmm. as opposed to somebody else's mm-hmm. barrels. Well, hey, interesting thought, right? Right. <laughs> Is that chewing on a popsicle stick, as I tell people? Right. We want we want it to taste like wine. We want it to taste like Chardonnay from the Arroyo Grande. Exactly. And I think, uh, you know, they the best way I've ever heard that put is from Mike Salachi at Opus saying it's a, it's a sense of time and place. In fact, one young lady, and I've said this a thousand times on the podcast, so they're probably tired of hearing it, but one young lady from Armenia, a very bright young lady, she's running two wineries, one in Argentina and one in Armenia, and she said, what other product can you take across the world and place on the table and say, this is who we are from when we were? Right. Right? The vintage. And I think that's a powerful thing uh, to be able to say. And maybe... Maybe that's what the value of the wine is. Maybe that's what the wine was supposed to be. Well, and one of my favorite things to do with folks when we open um, older vintages is is allow people, you know, when we're in a group together to reflect on what what was I doing in yeah, 1997? Right. That's clever, what, yeah. what was I doing, that's you know, in, in 2000? That's great. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, wine is just really cool that way. Do you, do you have non-wine related friends, the oh, family? Yeah. Okay, so well, one of my cousins doesn't drink wine at all. So. Oh, okay, well, the, the point is to bring up is even with new acquaintances. Even last night we had a dinner uh, at our house. Just a couple came over and we were talking. And because I'm in the wine business, and because it's such an interesting product, and because people that that want to always want to learn about it, if they don't know anything, they want to learn at the beginning. If they know something, they want to learn more. That the conversation often revolves around wine most of the night. Right. It always comes well, seems a, to come back to it. Well, it's a fascinating topic. It I is. Mean, it's yeah. a really fun topic. Um, you, you and I were talking off camera about Dan Barber's uh, Blue Hill Farms and, and the biodynamic movement in, in vegetables and fruits and uh, raising animals. Um, what kind of farming are you doing for vegetables in the tally vineyards? Um, <clears throat> so at, at Tally Farms, Farms um, yeah. the majority of, of what we grow is uh, essentially conventional yeah. um, produce. Having said that, we have always been committed to uh, really approaching that with a very soft hand. Yeah. Uh, I, I live uh, on on our farm, yeah, or, so. you know, right on the edge of it, yeah. uh, as do many of my employees. And so I want to be very, very careful and take my responsibility as a steward uh, very, very land. seriously. Having said that, uh, we do have um, a portion of vegetables that we we grow that are certified organic. Um, quite frankly, that is really driven by marketing considerations. Mm-hmm. Um, organic, and we'll see where biodynamic really goes. Yep. But organic is is about the most powerful m- marketing term in agriculture. Well, we, you know, we, we everybody's got their opinions of it, and I and I just find it an interesting subject. The biodynamics, another crazy, crazy subject. And, I, and I'll tell you one thing that was brought to me. I thought was very interesting. Then I want to get into the SIP certification conversation. But um, uh, Piero and Chenza from I think his grandparents were Sasakaya, one of those Bulgari uh, super Tuscans, and he grows biodynamic Pinot Noir in in uh, Patagonia. Okay, and. He made a comment I thought was really interesting. He says, "If the if the moon, the earth, I'm sorry, if the moon's gravitational pull can move oceans, and your body's ninety percent water, imagine what it's doing to your body." And I go, "Okay." I said, "I can understand that. That's kind of right. interesting." But your comment's really important because um, most of the winemakers I speak to from Europe that have children that are or live next to the vineyards are saying, look, I'm there every day. I don't want my kids playing. I want people walking around in that. So we are very specific and very careful about what we do with our land because it's we're there. Right. We're part of it every day. 
And, you know, you were probably crawling around if you were a kid, right? I was actually, uh, they didn't exist when I was a kid because uh, okay, we started planning, bash. but I was, I was <laughs> absolutely uh, going to work with my dad. Uh, and I grew up wanting to be a farmer. Yeah, and yeah I so. spent a lot of time in vegetable fields. But I mean, one of the things that to, to kind of clear up regarding organic, a lot of people assume that that means that um, whatever we're growing is not being treated with with pesticides, and that's that's not true. That's not true, yeah. Yeah. Um, basically, what organic means is that we are only using certified organic products mm -hmm. um, on <clears throat> whether it's vegetables or or wine grapes or we we actually I grow about a hundred acres of lemons um, organically, really? wow. and. Uh, it, again, something that people don't understand is that some of the products that we use, sulfur is probably a very good example. Great example. Everybody understands that. Which, which is actually uh, pretty harsh. You know, it's, yeah. it's harsh for people. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. It's, it's um, not very good for beneficial insects. Right. And, and, you know, it works very, very well um, for controlling mildew uh, in, in, in a vineyard. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there is new chemistry with much softer products that, in my opinion, um, are more uh, respectful of the environment that are not certified organic. And do, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and, do this, and, that's, and do the same thing. Right. And well, in some cases they better. do it better. Yeah. That's and, interesting. Yeah. Right. And and this is the part of the conversation that uh is too subtle for most people to really really understand. They just and and I think the reason why organic has become such a powerful term is that you can go into a place like Whole Foods and uh, feel virtuous. You're mm -hmm. spending extra money yep. to to buy something that's supposedly safer and better for the environment. I agree with that. I agree with the analysis. So, I won't buy organic anything. Uh, not I don't go out to seek it, but it, particularly certain countries that grow it. I, how would I? Well, even then trust, you don't even trust. They don't even trust that, that they're organic, right? right? And they don't. And the funny thing that I always come from is that it doesn't necessarily taste better. In fact, I, I often challenge chefs that are on the show. If you and I go to the Santa Monica chef's market and you buy everything organic, I buy everything conventional and we cook the same foods at the same temperature with the same presentation, is one going to taste better than the other? And I've got a 50-50 split. This is from Michelin star chefs. Right. <laughs> they can't agree on whether that matters or not. And I, it's just a subject that comes up here at the, the Wine of the Month Club. Uh, another interesting misnomer when, we, when you're talking about marketing is natural. Right. There's no such definition in food or in wine. Right. Except something to the expense, extent that it's the uh, FDA assumes there's nothing in there that shouldn't be. It's not a rule. It's just an assumption on their part. Right. It's written on their well, side. And as I understand it, and I'm not in the natural wine business. I consider my product to be very, natural, very natural. But in terms of you know meeting that particular definition, as I understand it, natural wines now are understood to be wines that are produced from grapes that are grown organically and then not treated with sulfur uh, in the winery. And you know, it's you can very, be organic very, and do that. Uh, what's that? You can be organic and treat with sulfur. Well, certainly in the vineyard. Yeah. But in terms of using sulfur dioxide, which is the key preservative that has been used, uh, it's actually a byproduct of fermentation. Right. So the first it's thing is it's still it's, there. It's, it's there. We're just adding a little bit more. Right. And it's it's been a part of the recipe, you know, of classical winemaking for more than a thousand years. And I mean, they they figured out, <laughs> like the Romans figured out, that if you burned a sulfur wick in a barrel before you put the wine in there, it it the wine Less was better. Yeah. It, it protected it. So how about that? <laughs> right. And, and so, you know, it was interesting. I was just speaking with a retailer um, earlier this morning who, you know, he's, he's a little bit younger than, in fact, I think he's five years younger than I am. And he was just talking about these natural wines. You know, they, they just reopened after COVID and, you know, the first people that walked in the door, I mean, he, he's happy to have new customers, but they wanted natural wine. And he said, I, personally, I can't stand it, but that's what they want. And that's, I, I'm going to go get it for them, you know? You know, but that's a that's the problem I have marketing wise. And I had a woman challenge me, and we, I have a club that sells organic and buys them. If you want it, we have it. I taste them all the time. Uh, there's sometimes a vibrancy difference to them, but generally, ninety nine point nine percent of people wouldn't be able to taste the difference if right. one was one wasn't. 
But she sent, she called me up and was very upset with me. And she said, I want, I can go to Trader Joe's and find organic wines for $4 and you don't have the organic sticker on the back of the label. And I said, ma'am, I said that this wine is not only organic, so it's biodynamic. And the winery chooses not to put their certification on there. As well as, I have to be really careful in featuring wines that are farmed organically and made organically, but they choose not to certify just because of the government. It's just government paperwork to do right. it, right? And so she says, no, I can go to Trader Joe's and get cheaper. And I said, well, I don't want to say go ahead, but- Well, <laughs> I mean, kinda, that is- <laughs> You kind of wanted to. <laughs> right. Uh, but I had, and I can't call her dumb, stupid. Like, look, I'm telling you, we, they fill out a form for me. If the winemaker told me he-, he had, committed to the fact that that's what it is. He just doesn't put it on the label because he chooses not to make well, that a and, thing. Well, and again, the organic wine is wine made, as I understand it, from organically grown grapes, but without additional sulfur. Right. And most people, many people, up until we got into the natural wine movement, chose not to make wine that way because it's it's inherently unstable. That's right. It, it doesn't ship very doesn't well. Ship well. It, it, yeah, as soon as you open it, if it's not already bad, and I've right. tasted a number of those, right. it goes bad very quickly. And so consequently, there's more and more wine from California that's being produced from organically grown grapes, but the winemaking is conventional. That's right. In, in the sense that they're using CLI. sulfur dioxide. So do you think that is a consumer... It's a misnomer for sure, and in my opinion, it's sometimes almost deceitful to say made with organic grapes because I, as a consumer, don't know the difference. I walk by the aisle, it says, oh, it's organic. I'm doing a favor for myself. I shop at the Whole Foods and I buy organic bell peppers, so I think I'm going to buy organic wine, and it's not because once it got to the, once it got to the winery, they it, added, it was, if, it was if conventional. If they added sulfur, right. Then, then technically, it's not organic wine. So there's a whole, there's a, and, and the, the another part of the confusion. I, and I get the organic part. At least they've got some certifications. There's different ones for Europe and America, and biodynamic has Demeter. You know, those are interesting things. But there's also a whole bunch of other movements. I heard of one yesterday from a French winemaker, and I can't remember the name of it. But I do know that there's a raw movement out of London. Uh, Isabelle Legeron, she's an MW, who started this group of wineries. I don't know what the definition of raw is, and it's not a certification, but she has a group of wineries. Uh, Ambeth is one that's in Paso Robles. There are a few others in America. Well, I, 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 I'm not exactly sure what raw wine is, but but my wine is, I don't cook it. So, <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so it may, hopefully it meets the definition of raw. I suppose it would. <laughs> then the French have come up with uh, Von Method, uh, Naturel, uh, Saint, uh, Souf, Souf Ajout, Ajouté. It's no sulfur added. Right. Their definition is uh, uh, hand, hard harvested, I'm not sure what the, you know, organic value that is, but hand harvested, um, no pesticides or certain pound of pesticides, but sulfur is allowed and uh, one other condition. So I wouldn't know that as a consumer if I'm buying that. And their logo says Von Method Naturel on it. Maybe I think something's good about it. Maybe I don't think, maybe there is. And I'm wondering, just trying myself as a marketeer, like my daughter took me to Brooklyn not too long ago, natural wine shop. Oh yeah, and she goes, oh, that looks interesting. So I grabbed this near Davila from Sicily, and I, you know, you and I are in the wine business. So I, I put up on the counter it was seventy five dollars. Wow, I'm like I don't pay seventy five dollars for wine. You know who does that, right? Um, sorry, my phone went off. Um, so we take it back to the hotel, and it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I looked at her, and, so, and she's a, all my kids are millennials. Okay. Did she like it? No, she yeah. couldn't like it. So she looked at me, and I said, "See, I go, you can't just—it's just not the point, right? The point of a good glass of wine is a good glass of wine. It's not about whether or not you think you're doing yourself a favor and muscling down something that doesn't taste very good. Right? That's just not the point. Deliciousness <laughs> is an important um, consideration for me. And so, when it comes to to vegetables. Um, you know, this, I had this, we were talking about the Blue Hills Farm book a little bit. And we went to a restaurant the other night with Chef Joachim Slichal. He's a friend. He owns a winery in the Provence. Actually, last time I ran into Joachim, he, oh, was, he told okay. me about that. And that, that was sort of the biggest boondoggle yeah. in his life at that <laughs> moment. <So. He's>, <laughs> COVID, <laughs> COVID, COVID got to the winery and he's, I think he's there right now. Uh, but great guy. But we took him to a restaurant here in Pasadena. And he had been there before, but 
afterwards we were talking, he says, the tomatoes in that pasta weren't fresh. You know, you just tasted it. Right. And it goes, and this is what I'm interested about your book, this cookbook, because this is, food should be seasonal. Absolutely. And, and I've had this question and maybe, I don't know if there's an answer to this. And I argued with my youngest daughter about it. So you, you have non-GMO foods, right? Uh, we do because first of all, there's very, very little GMOs um, in most vegetables. Most vegetables are such niche items that it doesn't pay for- really? Yeah. And, and so most of the GMO stuff, now corn yeah. uh, is, is an exception, but m- most of the GMO crops are huge commodity crops like soy, yeah, right. and cotton, and and I see. and and corn, not so, bell peppers and right. heirloom tomatoes, and you know because they're all too too nichey. So would that be a marketing thing if I put non-GMO on my tomatoes in the market? We, because we, yeah, <laughs> and we actually promote that a little bit, which I think is ridiculous. But there's no GMO to my. I mean, there there may there be GMO be tomatoes, yeah. but but there's no GMO peppers, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I got this argument with my daughter, and I don't know the answer. I was just challenging her. She was in college at the time, so you know we got to challenge the college kids. GMO is genetically modified organism, mm-hmm. right? But it, there's like forty thousand strains of wheat or something that have all evolved from crossbreeding. And if you want a wheat that grows taller, whatever the parameters of wheat are, you you crossbreed them. So what is the difference besides one being done in a lab and one being done in, in naturally that you end up with the same kind of wheat? One that's been doctored up in the lab, one that's been crossbred. Is 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 there a real difference? Is there a real? I'm not, I'm not challenging anybody, I'm not, and I don't have a position on because I don't know. But is there a difference if the DNA of that piece of wheat's the same either way? Not to me. And I think that um, that's an area where, as I understand it, when scientists have have really looked at this, have concluded that the whole GMO argument is ridiculous. <laughs> so. And and, so I, and I realize that I am saying things right now that that could really rub some people the wrong way. Well, but. you know, the, the beginning of this beginning of the show when they listen to it goes, "Hey, I'm going to peel it back, and you're, it's going to land where it's going to land." And I think these are questions I think people have, and I have it, and uh, had the arguments with people. Just like, for instance, this, the following question: Since we're on the subject and we're having fun with it, um, we go back to you bring forward from 19 post war a steak at, at a steakhouse known to be a good place. You know, not, let's not go to the charlatans, but a steak that serves good steak. That would be Jocko's Steakhouse in Napomo, California. Okay, so instance. we're going to go to Jocko's Steakhouse in Napomo. Right. And I'm going to bring a steak from, you know, reputable farm from 2021. And, you know, I think the FDA started in the late 1800s or something, but let's just say that the effects in the controls that are in place for meat are different, uh, considerably different than they were then. And they're supposed to protect the consumer, right? Right. That's what we're supposed to do. But let's just say it's a rip. Does the steak, because it's not been adulterated, it's not been played with, it's not eaten, uh, the cow's not eaten modified grass or whatever it's going on out there, does the steak from 1940 taste better than the steak from 2021? I would suspect not. You would think that? I I think that that steak, like wine, in 2021 is going to be superior uh, for, for the most part. Now, I mean, there, there can be certain anomalies. I mean, you know, with wine, maybe, maybe we're talking about one of the greatest vintages of the century. Yeah, well, and, I understand but, that. But, but in just, in general. I, I guess in terms, in general, I would predict that the steak you're going to eat in 2021, along with the glass of wine that you're washing it down with, both will be superior, superior. products in 2021 than in 1948. So you know the uh, San Francisco Fancy Food Show? Uh, yes, yes, I've yes. heard. I've never been, no, but I've, yeah. Well, if you want indigestion, then that's the place to go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I have an uncle who passed away since, but a very famous guy he invented the spoon straw and the flexi straw. His name was Art. Oh. And he... When we did shows together, including the packaging show, because that was his specialty, he says the only way to do a trade show is you start at one end of the, the convention center and you go to the other. And you just right. go up in every aisle. So I took my wife and kids a few years in a row to the fancy food show. 
we were selling chocolates here and pastas and things. And so we'd start the corner and, and it's, it's, it's crazy. You have jerky, then vanilla ice cream, and then you have prosciutto, and then you have hot, you know, Tabasco that does jelly sound beans. like a tummy ache. Right? And I was going to open a Pepto Bismol booth at the end, you know, <laughs> but you go up and down. And so I get, I had just gotten a, a, an email from one of the vendors saying, come to our booth, you know, and it's bone sucking barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. You see the brand around. And I asked the question of the young man standing at the booth, just like that. It's a huge booth. It was a 20 by 20. And he goes, I don't know. He goes, let me ask my mom. She used to work at a steakhouse like that. Oh. And so he goes, mom, in the meantime, this she must have been 88. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> now we're going to get the definitive answer. What did she say? And she slept in barbecue sauce to some guy like hold on a second i got i'm finishing this pitch right now <laughs> <laughs> she comes over she goes absolutely she goes the steak from the 40s is way better now obviously you know we're talking about a woman who was slinging hash right i mean yeah. uh, who knows the real answer doesn't make any sense she said i was thinking that's a biased opinion of it but i thought it was funny because sh she was there when that happened and i and so the question and that's the question is you know, we, we, we dig the holes, we put the seeds in, you know, we, we're trying to be good to the environment. We're trying to produce good food for people to eat. And um, it seems that the steward of the ground and the steward of the, the vegetable and the steward of the grape is going to prevail eventually. And this is what sustainable farming means, right? You remember of SIP? Um, oh, yeah. S yeah, sus uh, sustainable Sustain in practice. Yeah, is in what practice. Sip. And I had a great conversation with Beth Vukmanic. Beth Vukmanic. I don't know if you know. Did you ever meet her? Uh, yeah, I have met her. And um, actually, my vineyard manager, a gentleman na uh, named Dave Terry, is on her board of directors for the Central Coast Vineyard team. Okay. So she, I had a great conversation. I listened to it the other day, actually, because of us, because you're SIP certified. And I wanted to have some conversation points. And and she, I asked her, I go, just, just for fun, I said, I go, Beth, can you send me a couple PR pictures so I can put it on the podcast thing? And she sends me this picture of her doing like this sit-up with a kettlebells and a weighted vest and weights on her ankles. And she is cut. I mean, she is one cut girl. So yeah. the beginning of our podcast, I go, before we talk about farming, I said, you are cut, girl. And so she, She's like, well, I just, we had a five minute conversation on working out yeah. in the discipline, right? Well, this is what sustainability does for That's you. That's right, you know? I suppose. You know, look at, take a picture, or, uh, take a look at my mom on the cover of that cookbook and yeah. you can see what eating uh, great, great vegetables and, does for you. That's right. Yeah, my mom is 80 years old. Really? Yes. Wow. In that picture, she was 76, but... Uh, That's amazing. She looks great. Yeah. And they got the sun down the back of her hair, sort of highlighting. Yeah, okay. that was, it was a beautiful yeah. day in Rosemary's Vineyard. So tell me about the certification. Because when I re-listened re to my podcast with her, she, something was very important that she said, and that is the needs of, and this kind of flies in the, into the, agrees with the conversation we just had in the sense of when you're, when you're SIP certified, the needs of a Paso Robles farmer are different than the needs of a Monterey farmer. Yes. An Arroyo Grande farmer, and the different than the needs of somebody from, from uh, you know Blue Hill Farms. So I found that rather uh, pliable. That it makes sense that you don't need to put the things in your farm that protects somebody, uh, somebody's farm on the East Coast or, or right. anywhere else. And I can tell you, I've I've actually grown grapes in Paso Robles and grown grapes in Arroyo Grande, and one of the most fundamental differences between growing in the two areas, which you know, about 50 miles apart yeah. with a mountain range right in the middle of it called the Santa Lucia's mm -hmm. is, um, you know, Paso Robles is, is a warm to hot climate and mildew really doesn't grow very actively there. Whereas the Arroyo Grande Valley being right next to the ocean and, you know, a lot of days in, in the mid seventies, excuse me, we, we, suffer from very high mildew pressure. Mm -hmm. Mild mildew thrives under those conditions. Consequently, we have to use a lot of fungicides, um, predominantly sulfur and some other materials to really control that mildew. And one of the things as I really looked into biodynamic farming that I, I never agreed with was a very sort of prescriptive treatment approach, mm -hmm. protocols. It's like no matter where you are in the world, you're supposed to apply silica at a certain rate mm -hmm. on a certain date. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as a farmer, um, I only want to apply what needs to be applied when it needs to be applied. And there are some times when the answer is never 
That's that's I think that's what the sustainable methodology is about. Right. Right. It's a much more um, intuitive isn't quite the word I'm looking for, but it's it's a it's a more flexible approach that is. Um, uh, I, I guess more adaptive. It's mm-hmm, a more, mm-hmm. and it really came out of the University of California's approach to, and um, now I'm forgetting the term that they they really developed in um, uh, really in the 1970s. That was, uh, I can't believe I can't yeah, remember this. Yeah, but but in any event, it, it's it's only about again using. A material because it's required because it's going to um, whatever pest you are concerned about is going to cause economic harm yes. to to your crop. There are some things that happen that cosmetically maybe it changes the color of the leaves. Yeah. Well, if you're growing fruit and the fruit is about ready like a grapevine, <laughs> yeah. and and we're you know a few days from harvest, who cares what is happening yeah, with the right. leaves at yes. that point? Doesn't matter. Right. And and so that's so, interesting. Right. So it's also more of a holistic approach to the whole thing, right? The labor fees. Uh, I think there's you know, water recycling, or you're using water for other things. Uh, the way you cool the winery. Uh, there's there was right. a sip guy that you know grows grass on his roof to keep it. You know, that's his natural. Right, and and SIP, SIP accounts for all of that. By the yeah. way, the the term that came out of UC Davis is integrated pest management, and you know it was really a protocol because because up until this point in the 1970s, and and I will admit my my grandfather farmed this way. It was a more sort of like prescriptive, like okay, at this point in the crop we we apply this sort of proactively prophylactically mm-hmm. we don't do that anymore yeah. you know we bec- one because it's expensive right. both from a labor standpoint and and some of these materials are very very expensive and you know just philosophically we d- we don't want to use anything that's not required that's it, right do you do anything like cross cross uh, plant so that if the soil's low in nitrogen or magnesium or whatever we're using out there um, between crops, between rows. Yes. Plant other things that are rich cover in. Cover crops. Yeah, cover crops. And, and you know, again, that really depends on the site. I mean, I I have some sites where um, I want to add a bit more nitrogen. And so we're going to plant a cover crop in that site that um, has some legumes, probably some vetch. Those are both, uh, you know, high in nitrogen. Mm-hmm. We till those into the soil in, in the springtime and we get a nice little release of nitrogen. I have other sites that um, are growing a little bit more vigorously than I would like. So in that case, I'm going to plant something like ryegrass um, or um, even barley that can more effectively compete with the vine mm-hmm. and and actually reduce some of that mm-hmm. vigor. So, so all of the management is really tailored to the needs of a specific, uh, you know, plot of, of land. And that goes for whether I'm growing wine grapes, lemons, avocados, or 20 different kinds of vegetables that we grow. Are, they, are vegetables... Just- as receptive to where they're grown as grapes are? Yes. And, you I'd know, love to it, taste that. It, yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you because we, we've grown bell peppers uh, as our signature crop yeah. in, in a Royal Grande for, you know, for many years. And we grew uh, bell peppers for more than 20 years in the Bakersfield area. The r- reason why we did that was because it extended our season. Mm-hmm. We would harvest the bell peppers uh, in Bakersfield starting in the middle of June and usually carry that through about um, late July, 1st of August. And by that time, we would start on the coast. And I remember my grandfather coming into our our yard where all the peppers you know, were, and he got out of his car and he said, this is crazy. I see all these peppers, but I can't smell them. They were completely different. <laughs> really? they, they, they did not have the, the beautiful dark yeah. color that we, we see um, on the coast. And they, they didn't have the thick walls that uh, our bell peppers are, are noted for. And they didn't, they didn't have that pungent uh, uh, pyrazine wow. smell that is, you know, the hallmark of, of bell peppers. So going along with that. Big difference between peppers, even to the point where they were hard to market at the same time when we were crossing over really? from wow. the ones in the valley yeah. to the ones on the coast. The buyers didn't They're want like, the ones. They didn't want those wow. anymore. Yeah. Because 
maybe you can explain this to me. Driving down the five freeway, even um, even a few weeks ago, we, you know, going, actually the forty six, we drove by James Dean's last stop. Oh yeah, yeah. Shalam. Which I, which is, I don't know why I bought the olives from there because they were horrible. Yeah. I had them last night. Um, but I, I ask this question all the time, and actually the first time I ever heard this analogy or this comment was actually from a software programmer uh, when I was selling software in the old days at a software company, and we went to this very brilliant seminar. And I can't remember the, why he used this analogy, but it, he said something like, why do you think a tomato at the bottom of the truck going down the five freeway isn't being smushed? And I thought, wow, you know, I've never thought of that, but I use it all it's the time. Because, because they're <laughs> picking a green tomato. <laughs> exactly, and they don't have any flavor. Right. <laughs> so... So tell me about your cookbook. You got our California table. Just just published. It feels just published. Uh, no, I uh, it was actually published was in 2016, and uh, yeah, I wrote you a little note there. Thank you. And uh, you know, I, I tell people ever since I was in college, and yes, I I followed in my my grandfather and my parents' uh, footsteps and went to UC Berkeley. Uh, ever since I was in college, I, I wanted to write a book. And once I figured out I could write a book that was mostly pictures, That's, <laughs> you know, I, plus- You don't have to write so much. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, this was really a great way to tell my family's story, tell the story of, of a Royal Grande. Which, cook Avant. That's great. Yeah. And I, I love to cook. And uh, I'd started keeping a cooking journal in the in the mid '90s, where I would note, you know, if 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 I always experimented a lot, yes. And it was like, oh wow, I really like that. I'm going to write down, you know, what I did, and I would refine these recipes. Um, I would make notes about food. Did wine you start with anything like a Scoffier's, you know, uh, uh, cooking book in 18, 1907, or did you just? pick up the skillet and start trying things? So first of all, um, both my parents uh, were very accomplished cooks. My yeah. my mother, her attitude is if you can read, you can cook. And so she is a big one for following recipes, very accomplished baker. Um, my grand or my father, as well as my grandfather, very accomplished with Santa Maria style barbecue and grilling in, in general. And so, uh, and then once I got married, uh, even before I was married and my wife and I were together, uh, I've always done 80% of the cooking. It's just what I, I like to do. And um, it, it just ended up being a really, really fun project. And, project. and I did not um, work with es uh, Escoffier's cookbook. Um, I was really <laughs> was inspired by, by um, Julia Child, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So very so French still. Mastering the art of yeah. French cooking because she really brought it to a place that was very relatable yeah. for Americans. And I think that's why she was so successful. My mother was an excellent cook. She passed away last year. She was very accomplished. We have a 200 recipe cookbook of hers and that's ac accumulated recipes. And we, used to, she and I used to always talk I used to sit on the counter, watch her cook. Right. She would make, she always made something different. And she do you like make, to cook? I love to cook. I mean, right. She makes Chinese food. She made Armenian food. She made, you know, meatloaf, whatever she was making. It was always something new and trying things. <clears throat> and I think that's where the passion came from, just sitting there watching her. I never did it with her, but she was always, I was always sitting on the counter talking to her. And I find that relaxing and I find it fun. And the other day, just before she passed away, she gave me a book and I opened the book up and it was a Scoffier's book. It was like the 1962 edition. And it was given to her by my great, my grandfather when he came to America. He was only here for a few months before he passed away, but he bought her as a wedding anniversary uh, gift, sixth wedding anniversary, the Scoffier's book. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I was going to master the five mother sauces. Pretty good with tomato, tomato the sauce tomate, pretty good with bechamel, pretty good with uh, velote. Butchered the Espanol, the brown sauce. No, <laughs> As I, thought I don't even know that. what's in that. <laughs> well, I thought I'd make it from scratch, which is a huge mistake. I should have just started with some veal broth and gone from there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I just find it fun and fascinating. And, and now when I cook, I ruined something the other night. I made some chicken that just wasn't very good. Yeah, but that happens whatever. to me every once you in know, a while. It just wasn't that great. But let me ask you this question. I'm running on an hour. I want to ask you a question about the lifestyle. Sure. And then we're going to have this trivia question. So I have this conversation a lot, and it's with winemakers mostly, but I think with farmers and the fact that you're third generation, it's an important question. Uh, and it, it goes to the idea that we go to Napa, we're successful surgeons or we're successful you know, freeway contractors for the government, and we have enough money to just go to Napa, buy the biggest vineyard we can find, and build this 
exorbitant chateau and try and, and hire buy. The, the consultant to get a hundred points. Right. Right. Exactly. Yep. You know where I'm going with this. So can you, can you buy this lifestyle? This is your third generation. You've got this appreciation for the, the pace of the lifestyle, the pace of a crop, the pace of cooking, the pace of the family being involved. Can you buy it? Can you just go in there and buy it and say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a farmer now? Um, that's really a profound question. And um, first of all, uh, you, you have to, I mean, if you can't fake liking to cook. Right. And, you know, I, uh, invited a, I invited a guy over to my house the other day. He's going to build his house right down the street from me. And I showed him my outdoor kitchen, which is where I spend. I have a, a barbecue pit, a gas right. grill, and a pizza oven, wood-burning pizza oven. And he said, wow, I'm kind of thinking this is really cool. I said, do you like to cook? He said, no, not really. I said, I wouldn't spend a dime on any of this stuff. If it doesn't bring you pleasure, don't wow. do it. You know, yeah, I mean, that's it, interesting. he's like, you're right. I don't like to do that. I like <laughs> so, to work on cars in my garage. That's what I'm going to do. Put a I'm, lift in. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to build a big garage for wow. my stuff. That's a good, that's a good point. It's a really good point. So but follow it's, your I, passion. I think that's it because otherwise you, there's something romantic about the wine business. I'm not, probably not, not as much as vet, farming vegetables, but there's something romantic about the wine business, something, something socially stature wise that you, if you own a winery and you build big columns in Napa Valley, you, you've become something. And I think a lot of people get dismayed at the fact it takes too long, it's slow, it's expensive, and it's really hard to make a dollar. Right. right? It's particularly that if you're part of from it. scratch. Right? And my grandfather really. was right about that part. So I lied to you. There's one more question. Have you ever read the story about the real Santa Maria barbecue from the 1951 Safeway? No. Oh, you got to read the story. Okay, story. I will Google that. Uh, yeah, Google the story. I, uh, I paraphrase it. The one-armed butcher. Okay, that's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> what happened with the one-armed butcher? And the recipe that I have from that story is um, a garlic, salt, uh, oregano, uh, rosemary, salt, and pepper. I think those are the main ingredients. And it's for fabulous. the seasoning. Yeah. yeah, for the seasoning. It's fabulous. All right. This is a trivia question, and I'll wrap it up because this is a lot of fun. This is a book. This is a real book. It's called uh, it, Wine is the Best Medicine, so we can apply it to vegetables as well. Okay. Because it, this is a real doctor. He was a French doctor, a, an MD. He also was a holistic doctor. Sort of, And this book is it's, it does have a disclaimer saying, do not consider this medical advice. <laughs> Hopefully he's telling people to drink wine every day. I mean, so, that's that's about the best medical advice I can think so of. I'm gonna, well, it's kind of close. So I'm going to give you uh, a, an ailment. Okay. And then the, the his cure for the ailment, at least symptomatic relief anyway. Okay. And so the um, the ailment is flatulence. Oh. Which is one of my favorite ones to talk about. Yeah. And you can help yourself with your flatulence with either a gra And I ask you for the dosage after the answer a grave a dry champagne or a dry white um alsatian wine so grave um champagne or what was the last one dry white alsatian you know, uh, dry a alsatian so a gewurztraminer or, or a like dry that. riesling or right. something i well first of all personally i don't think it's going to be sparkling wine because um you're just adding more gas well, I guess that, that's a gimme okay good you're you're, you're, you're adding <laughs> gas to the system uh i'm going to go with the alsatian wine hey you got it wow and it's um <laughs> okay and see. the dosage the dosage is for half a bottle a day. I was going to, that's what I was going to say. Well, half, yes, a bottle. half a bottle a day. So who wouldn't, right? Yeah. I would enjoy all the flatulence you want. You right. Well, and since you brought up uh, flatulence, that's that's why it's important to soak your beans oh, okay. uh, either <laughs> overnight or- Is or, that in the cookbook? It is. Okay, good. There's a tip about that, which I picked up from Rick Bayless. Yeah, uh, okay, he, good. He Thank covers you. how to cook beans very well in his actually book. the other night i made santa maria beans and i was gonna start with dry beans and i just didn't have time so i ended up buying canned ones the, and the, work. the recipe for santa maria style beans pinkito beans yeah, pinkito. um is in the cookbook. oh cool yeah oh santa that's maria gonna be style, exciting my my version of santa maria style barbecue which which eliminates both the the oregano and the rosemary but has um garlic salt or garlic powder salt and pepper oh, okay so it's yeah same thing. So it says here, though, because their their content in mineral salts and oleo oleo o l i g o oligo elements constitutes a precious a, a precious contribution to combating any tendency towards intestinal sluggishness. 
which affects the smooth muscles of the digestive tract. See, so <clears throat> there's all kinds of things: diarrhea, bronchitis, hmm. fever, gout, hypertension, menopause, nervous depression, etc. And so, how many of your guests have? Um, I, I mean, I, I got. I pretty much nailed the. You the, nailed it, and you're the only second person I've nailed it. I've probably asked the question a dozen times. Okay, well, and I, mean, I usually pick flatulence, so sometimes if female persuasion, I won't do it. <laughs> you know, this has been a fabulous conversation, and we can probably talk for another hour, and I hope we can. Um, but thank you for the book. It's going to be fun to t to try, and I'm going to start right out with the Santa Maria style beans. And um, good luck out there. We're, we're excited for the wines. I want to bring some in and have the uh, listeners have a chance to get them. Awesome and. Uh, just wonderfully complex, and and I I said feminine to one, and the other one was a little bolder, but very Chardonnay. You get to taste the Chardonnay. That was kind of what's fabulous about them. And the Pinot Noir, just you know, mouthful of wine. It's really beautiful. Well, thank you. And and uh, Chardonnay um, hasn't gotten the respect in California that it it should. And I am a believer that uh, Chardonnay makes the world's greatest dry white wine. If it's grown in the right. right place and treated with respect. So that's I, what you know, we do. It's, it's funny. These are gorgeous examples of what happens in California with a good Chardonnay and it's not over treated, right? right? The other way to get that experience is maybe a, a properly made Chablis, which is going to be 10 times the price. But I do try to show those wines once in a while for finally to get somebody to taste something that, you know, you don't know what you're going to get at the market. You may get a Rombauer, which is tasting like we're talking about. You know, chewing on the leg of a table. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a great expression of the grape without, you know, we don't want to taste the wood. Right. But it's okay to influence a little bit. Well, exactly. And and that's really um, captured in the cookbook as well, the ethos of celebrating the natural ingredients as opposed to- all Is the it on Amazon? Uh, no, it's at uh, tallyvineyards.com. Tallyvineyards.com, yep. where everything else is. And what's the, what's the, the produce website? Uh, tallyfarms.com. Tallyfarms.com. Yeah. I'm looking simple. forward to that first shipment next week. And thank you again for being on the show. Good All to right. See you. Thanks, Paul. This Cheers. was wonderful. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul, Callum, Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. And of course, all these podcasts are sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, 48 years in business. Don't forget to visit our website, wineofthemonthclub.com. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers. Cheers.